welcome to the Working Perspectives Podcast. I'm Matt Lavelle, coming today by Jamie Iglesias, and our special guest today is the one and only Don Lyons. A little background here before we get started. Don Lyons, this is his third appearance on the show. His first ever appearance on the show was on May 4th of 2021. He was the 27th episode his first time here. He was the 80th ever video. It's been a long time coming. Super excited to have him back. Don, thanks for being back on. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm doing well. What about yourself? Hanging in, man. Hanging in. You know, a lot, we've, got, we, we've uh, engineered a couple things since the last time you are on. So I got a quick question to ask you. What movie do you think is better, The Godfather Part 1 or The Godfather Part 2? I've never seen either of them. <laughs> yep, I've never seen any of them. Sorry. You'd be you'd be surprised at how many people uh have that same exact answer. Including what about me? Yeah, okay. including including Jamie. What about Cheetos? Crunchy or puff? Puff. Based on what wow. I just my, my I just had a I had a crown replacement. So my tooth is mm. so I'm 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 leaning towards puff right about now. Yeah. Puff candy or puff puff Cheetos and gummy candy, all good stuff. Yeah, nice. I was, I was eating some flaming hot this week, and they are so addicting. Flaming hot Cheetos. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever I have the jalapeno how... ones? No, I'm not a big fan of like jalapeno, so I don't eat them. But the flaming hot, oh my god. I mean, are they really that they, hot? They are pretty hot, and they're addicting. Like you never okay. want to stop. Right. Yeah. Do you ever have the sweet and spicy Doritos? Mm. Oh my God, they're the same thing. Once you pop, you just can't stop, that, baby. I do spicy nacho Doritos. Spicy nacho is good. Maybe it is yeah. spicy nacho. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. But, oh, I love them. I just had them for dinner tonight. Oh, for dinner, spicy nacho Doritos. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Balanced yeah. diet, huh? Breakfast too. Yep. Wow. <laughs> nice. Uh Don, what about pancakes or waffles? Which one do you like better? Oh my god, that's that's a That's a doozy. Okay, I have a I have a see I I I got to make this a little more complicated than it needs to be. I only like waffles if they come from Cracker Barrel. Okay. Mm, Cracker Barrel is so good. Do, who did we have on recently, James? Didn't we have someone say recently <laughs> that that like I think it was Jupiter Jetson said that she prefers waffles except at Cracker Barrel. Well, really? she'll have okay. the pancakes. So yeah, she's like, like on the other side of you. But yeah. I've ne- like people have told me about this Cracker Barrel place and I've never been. You've never been? Never That's been. crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's close by us. This one in like Plymouth meeting, right? Yeah. 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 I don't know. I think I've never been one. My sister likes it, but my wife is not a fan. So. No? Mm. I don't know. She, I don't know. Maybe she just had a bad experience, but you know, yeah. she also has like weird taste. I mean, look at her husband. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so yeah. Uh, okay. Next question. Uh, when it comes to uh, amusement park, do you like a water park better or, or sorry, theme parks? Do you like a water park better or an amusement park? Mm, I might have to go with a water park. Mm. And and I say that. Because I just I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee this past summer, uh-huh. and we went to we went to a water park in Gatlinburg, and you know the little wave that they have, the wave pools. Like I oh had, yeah, I took Bryson in there, and this was like I was like a kid in a candy store. So I think I'm 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 gonna have to say I'm biased towards water parks nowadays. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, a good wave pool is a good time. Let's not you know let's call a spade a spade here. It's a good time. Yeah, when you're having fun, when you can body surf, and then yes. the best yep. is when if you get on like the arch. So like when the wave comes up, you jump up with it. Right, you're right, going right. Up and you know what I mean? Like, that's the yeah, best, yeah, dude. yeah, the carriage. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Did you ever hear, God, I don't know if it, uh, maybe BJ Penn. BJ Penn had a story where he was at like the, I don't know if it was BJ Penn. It was some uh, old UFC, old, uh, former UFC fighter. And he had a story where he was in a wave pool and there it was like this new wave pool. And it was like a surfing one too or something. Okay. And he got stuck inside where the wave comes out. Ow. Right. And he's like getting tossed back and forth. And there's only like a five second gap or something in between each time a wave gets out. And he's like, it's impossible to sneak through when the Jeez. thing is. And it's like dark and light. And he's in there like trying to fight to get back to his kids. And he's wow. swimming as hard as he can to get out without getting crushed. Like he was like, dude, he was like, oh, it's horrifying. The story. Oh, you crazy. know what I mean? Yeah nuts right but okay let's keep it going then all right when it comes next question when it comes to eating chicken wings are you drums or are you flats i am a flat man 
Yeah, Lee's a flatman. He's flat. a flatman, James. And, and I if, can't and, believe and that. If, so the crazy part is I'm like a stickler for chicken wings. So I'm, yeah. I'm like the type of guy that, like my kids and my wife, they don't know how to eat chicken. Mm-mm. And what I mean by that is they, they, they'll they bite a piece of chicken and it's like a bunch of meat. Yep. Where I'm from, the entire flat goes into my mouth, comes out, nothing but two bones. Yeah, literally <laughs> bone dry. Right. <laughs> that, that's how I eat chicken. Dude, hey, no, I appreciate, I appreciate a man who knows how to eat a damn wing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if people leaving the meat on the bone, are it's you crazy. kidding me? It's the waste of food. It's way, yeah, you waste the food. I, a good buddy of mine, he's like 6'5, mm-hmm. 270, maybe, maybe 250. Big hand, I mean, big barrel. I'm like, he's we're eating food one day. We're out at my sister's birthday party. I look at his plate. I'm like, what the hell? Are you done? He's like, yeah. I'm like, there's a bunch of meat on this chicken. Like, I, I, it was, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, there's this, you're too much man to have this much meat on your plate. Like, it, this thing should be bone dry. Yeah. Nothing yeah. but a bone. I don't want yeah. to get too close to the bone. <laughs> so if I have a little, I have, I have to leave a little bit of meat on there. Jamie, you're out yeah. of your mind. You're out of your mind. The best that is meat's waste. next to the bone. Yeah. No, you're, I could not agree more. I love it too. When they got like a hard nub on the end, you get that yep. guy, you know, yep. like, yep. Obviously the cartilage, no good. No one likes the cartilage, right. but dude, you got, I'll tell you nothing like grabbing a drum and ripping into that son of a bitch. And then, biting hungry, that. Man. oh man, <laughs> you got, are you, are you a good, are you a big wings guy? Yeah. Yeah, that was you actually, have a spot you go to? Um, no, actually. So Fridays, not Fridays. Uh, Applebee's has these really good Asian chili wings. Ooh, sweet really fat chili. Nice, nice and uh, sweet. And mm-hmm. I, I we eat them a lot. Yeah, I'm a big fan of those. There's a place by us. It's called the Metropolitan Diner. And okay. They have they have these sweet Thai chili wings, baby. All right, good sounds stuff. good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I, there used to be a place. Uh, I used to live in Roxboro. And around, I used to live on Ripka Street and around the corner from me uh, on, it was Mitchell. So I lived on Ripka Street between Mitchell and Peachin. And then on Mitchell Street, uh, before you get to Leverington, uh, there between Crams, I think it's Crams. Yeah, Crams and Leverington, there was a restaurant there called the Adobe Cafe. It was actually me and my wife's first date. Right. And I took her to the Adobe Cafe. But the reason I took her there is they used to have, I don't think they're in business anymore, uh, but they used to have the best. They were called Texas Ranchero Wings. Mm. Bro, when I say Delicious. like the the biggest thing about a wing is it's got to be crispy. You can't have a soggy wing. I'm not <laughs> down for the soggy wing. I want a crispy wing. These things are crispy, little spice, not too hot okay. to kill you. Okay. Got that Chipotle smoke kind of gimmick going. It, dude. Nice the best nice. so yeah shout out to adobe cafe fan of show listener yeah. show r.i.p but nice all right let's keep it moving let's keep it trucking enough talk about the good stuff also just to let you know justin i mean jamie i don't know if you're paying attention but he legit batted a thousand for justin on that one he said every except for the godfather answer because he's just never seen him but he legit said the answer justin's answer to every question so really i think you're Yep, I think you're the, missing out. Yeah, I think oh. you're the first ever one to bat a thousand uh for Justin. Right. So congratulations. All right. Thank uh you. but let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. So Don here, you are you're are you so what is it a financial advisor or what's your exact title? Yeah. So my, my exact title is a senior wealth strategist. That's my exact title. Love it. Senior yeah. wealth strategy. <laughs> yep, senior wealth strategist. So that means basically Damn. what I do is I work with clients or individuals uh building financial plans, right? Getting a sense of what they want to do long term, what their goals are, and really helping them map out a game plan or evaluating whether or not they can do what they want to do. Um, and that can be anything from saving appropriately, budgeting, investments, um, estate planning. Uh, even when we talk about just maybe gifting or uh, maybe buying a second home, I help clients evaluate that to get a sense of if it's feasible or not. Yeah. So here's I had uh, there's a guy I play basketball with. His name's Josh. Shout out. He's gonna be a guest on the show. I don't want to shout his last name out, but a uh, buddy of mine named Josh, right? And he was a fight. He worked. He like worked for Merrill Lynch and another one of the big companies. Uh, but he, you know, he was up there d- doing like financial stuff. And I was talking to him before this, and I asked him, I was like, "Hey, do you have a question that you would ask? You know, whatever, ask a financial advisor." And he was like, "He was like, well, do you want me to to you know screw him over, or do you want it to be a good question?" I was like, "No, a good a good a good question." So he his question come Josh's question is he told me to ask you why do advisor advisors charge people 
when they themselves could do it for free with little to no help? He said this is a toss up question. So, Don, why? Uh, yeah. Why? You, uh, what? What is the benefit of advisors, financial advisors, when if people knew they could handle this themselves? But I understand that they don't know. So, yeah, he said mm -hmm. that would be a toss up question. What do you what do you say to that? Pat? Yeah. So I think I think I think, you know, the, the, let me repeat. You're saying why do why do you hire advisors if you can do it yourself? So the question becomes, number one. Um, do you have the time to do it yourself, right? What what amount of time can you put into your personal investments, your personal situation, et cetera? That's the biggest one, right? How much time can you accurately or fully devote to managing your financial affairs, your investments, so forth and so on, right? Then the question becomes, do you have the skill, right? So if you don't have necessarily the skill set or the knowledge to do it, right, then you're probably better off having someone else do it for you. And then really, most importantly, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to put in the time to manage your, your own investments, or do you want to form that out to someone else? And then really it's a matter of expertise. Yeah. So those are the reasons why I think someone would hire an advisor over doing it themselves. Now you do find individuals who do want to do it themselves. Um, if, if that's an individual, by all means, please do so. Um, but if, if for those who don't want to do that, who don't want to put in the time to do it, who don't want to uh, research strategies, investments, et cetera, this is where we come in and we lend you with our expertise and mm -hmm. help you map out a game plan long-term. That's really my answer to that question. Have you ever had someone like you work for, right? And they kind of, uh, you know, work closely with you and they're asking you questions and things like that. And they themselves then kind of get an idea for the formula of maybe what to do and then go off and then do it themselves. Absolutely. So I think it happens okay. all times, especially in our business. So the one thing about financial services or wealth management in particular is it's one of the very few businesses because it's come most, it's a, it's a commodity in some respects, right? Um, so if I, if, if I recommend you a group of investments, right, you can get those same investments elsewhere, more than likely at a cheaper cost, right? But the, the value add really comes in the expertise that we're providing you with above and beyond the investments, right? So um, we talked to you about setting up different types of inv investment accounts for your kids, right? How should you position those accounts, right? What How should you be thinking from an, a long-term standpoint when it comes to life insurance? Um, now, what happens is in those in that arena, we talked to clients about how to manage your investments, what strategies we'll recommend. Um, but we have had a lot of folks that will take our investment recommendations, right? Oh, well, let me see what you got going. Okay, great. I'll look it over. And then go elsewhere and, and really implement the entire portfolio. So it yeah. does happen. It's part of the business. Uh, but we're, we're the only business where um, clients will come and automatically want a discount. And that's just the nature of the business because that doesn't really happen with any other business. You don't go to an attorney's office and say, uh, what are you? What are your fees? It's mm -hmm. a it's a five thousand dollar retainer through fifty per hour, and that's really the, it's it. That's it. You don't say, oh, well, I can get it elsewhere. Okay, well, get it elsewhere for a cheaper price. It's it yeah. is it's even when you look, you look at the medical profession, their prices are what they are. I think it's the only business that really the fee structure is competitive. That's because we've kind of positioned ourselves to say, okay, we can charge lower than the the next guy. Yeah, and you're competing like your your coworkers essentially are your competition in a way, or like the other people in the same field with you are your competition. Yes, same field, whereas, absolutely, absolutely. So, so yeah, like, not how, necessarily the coworkers. Go ahead, Jane. How do you get paid as an advisor? Is it like a percentage of what they earn off investments, or is it like a flat fee? Yeah, great question. So typically advisors are compensated in several different ways. One could be a full-fledged commission-based advisor where he or she will recommend a product or service, typically a mutual fund or an annuity of some sort. They will then charge you an upfront commission or a fee for that. And they will take a percentage of whatever it is. For example, uh, you have loaded mutual funds where they might sell you, let's say a portfolio of mutual funds. Um, the upfront sales charge could be four or 5%. So they'll, they'll get a portion of that. That's a commission-based advisor. Also, same thing with life insurance products or annuities. They charge a, a, a commission for that or that you pay a fee for that, but they're being, they work on a commission basis. That's one way. Uh, the other way is really a flat fee, which says, hey, listen, here's how much I'm going to charge you to work with me. Here's my standard fee. It could be an hourly fee. It could be $150 per hour. It could be a flat uh, fee of, let's say, $2,500 for the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then other firms will, char will charge on a percentage of the assets under management. So that's AUM fees, essentially. So that's a standard management fee. So the way we typically get paid is we charge a percentage of the assets. So we'll say, for example, if you have, let's say, $100,000, we'll charge you 1% of the $100,000 to manage your portfolio. And then that you get the entire gamut of, you know, expertise in, in wealth, ma wealth management, financial planning, um, estate planning, et cetera. So then what you want to do in that scenario, then say like, if you have someone that has a hundred thousand dollars, you get 1% of their initial investment is a hundred thousand, but then you get 1% on every, all the money that they make. So if you make them a million dollars, 
you get ten thousand dollars. Exactly. And so what happens is that's so what happens is most firms will charge, let's say, one percent per year. Oh, one okay. percent per year. Uh, so, they typically say we'll charge you a quarterly. So it's one percent per year. We'll charge you point two five percent per quarter as long as you're with us. Nice. Okay. So not, so if for people with multi million dollars like AR or annual revenue or growth or whatever you got, mm -hmm. I don't know how you guys categorize it, but for for those with multi million dollars, like say if you do have one percent and someone get gets uh you know twenty million dollars one year, yes, it's not you know like not a bad you know two hundred thousand no, dollars right there for no. be yeah. So like you know if you're playing it right, so okay, man, that's fast. I dude, honestly. I have like nothing. I remember, I remember when you and me talked with my wife, I was nothing but fascinated by this. Cause it is like you're gambling too. Cause there's a risk, right? So it's almost like, well, I wouldn't say gamble, uh, but it's a risk. It's a, it's, it's a, a risk. risk. Yeah, it is a risk. Yeah. You're taking, but, a but you're going, you're taking an edge. So what eventually like essentially kind of what the financial advisors are is like, you could take the risk blind or you could take the risk, Ed, like an educated risk mm -hmm. and with the financial advisor you're taking an educated risk and they know like i remember when we talked you told us like hey these are the safe safer bets here like this is kind of where you want to hedge your bets these are where you can see con like consistent growth and this is where we've had you know like this is where this has been good and and mm -hmm. if you're willing to spend this amount of money this is what you get kind of thing so like with, with that stuff i feel you know that's like uh it, like big stuff but also too like you were, you know, I think, I don't know, maybe now you've moved on to, I guess, uh, higher clientele, but back then too, you like, you were trying to help people build their pensions and build their retirement stakes and all those kind of things too, right? So you have like a sense of responsibility as a financial advisor where, I mean, it, it, you know, dealing with people's money is tricky. It's a sensitive, yeah. sensitive thing. So you need to be ultra trustworthy and like completely transparent and honest and like have every single cent accounted for as well. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Especially like you said, when you do when people's money, it's a different type of subject and it's a different process involved. So for example, if you go to Best Buy, right. Well, you, you know how you're in the mall and yeah. someone from Verizon, someone stops you. Hey, you want to come and try a phone? That's a quick purchase, right? You, you, you can look at a phone and buy it within 15, 20 minutes if you so choose. Right. When it comes yeah. to your, your, financial affairs, your investments, your money, your life savings, it's a different process altogether. It's not something you just walk in, hey, I want to hire you and that's it. It's a long process. Typically, typically it's a long process. Um, making folks feel comfortable with who you are as an advisor, you feeling comfortable with them, building rapport. Really, it's a relationship type of business. What we're into is really relationships. Um, this is why a lot of advisors try to focus on getting to know clients on the personal side as opposed to just their investments. Right. Yeah. Because the more you and I have a rapport, right? We talk about boxing, jujitsu, mm -hmm. right? The investments, that's that's secondary now because we've yeah. already established this really strong rapport elsewhere. Yeah. No, honestly, it's funny that you mention it like that. Like because like I've talked to you about it. So we had a guest on the show, and I'm not trying to be crass, but we had a guest on the show who's a professional escort, right? Okay. And when she was on the show, I she had talked about having clientele, and I told her, I was like, look. I've been training people, you know, in boxing for years, right? And one of the biggest things you want to do when training someone in boxing is you want to establish a rapport, right? right? Like it's yes, you're helping them train and meet their goals and teaching them a skill and and like getting them in shape and all that stuff. But the 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 really the thing that keeps them coming back is you guys develop a personal relationship exactly. where you like spending time with them and talking to them and there you can kind of trust them in a way. It's very similar to that with like an escort. And then also it seems in your business, like it's relationship building as yes. well, because yeah, like yeah, right. it's money is money is a sense. Like it's, you need yeah. to trust. Like you're not just going to give your money to Joe Schmo. Like you have yeah. to trust the person. So being very trustworthy, but that, you know, like it comes with being transparent and open and, and good at communicating as well, because it's not always going to be good news when you talk to these people. Yeah, either. Yeah. So, Actually, like, the, the, you know, no, the majority of, of people that make a financial decision is usually it's a financial decision, but it's really driven by emotions. When mm -hmm. we think about it at, at its essence, it's really an emotional decision uh -huh. based on money, based on money. Yep. And that's, that's basically it's, it's so, for example, if, if you and I meet, uh -huh. I can be the sharpest advisor you've ever met. I can have all the qualifications, the credentials, and you can say to yourself, you know what? I, I don't like this guy for some reason. Yeah. Right. And that's so that's an emotional decision. It has nothing to do with the fact that I could be a competent advisor. Um, mm -hmm. I could do well for you, et cetera, et cetera. You've said, hey, listen, I don't, I don't like him emotionally. Yeah. Then you meet someone else who could 
be in some cases maybe not as stellar in terms of credentials yeah but you built an, an emotional connection with him or her mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you're like yes uh, this guy's great i got a good feeling about him or her so now you're going to trust your money with this person gut, gut instinct you're saying can yeah. be yeah, yeah like you're yeah for sure man i'll tell you though like don i mean i don't know i feel like uh that's a skill that you have like you and in, in uh, i guess like you get like uh instill confidence in people in yourself in a way you're Thank very you. well spoken you're very polite you're nice like oh but i've seen you you know i've seen you also like you 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 know bs either man you know what i mean like you know so i don't know i think that like your your confidence i think gives other people confidence in you in a way if that makes yeah, sense yeah absolutely 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 did you have to do training on like as part of being a financial advisor did speaking to clients come with the the training or no no so that's actually something you have to develop on your own and that's a that's a really good question they don't really necessarily teach speaking or public speaking um yeah within different types of roles or within wealth management that's something you have to actually go out and and secret your own effect i'm actually enrolled in speech therapy as we speak Mm. um to kind of tighten up some things on my speech um really yeah yeah, I'm, I'm you're actually, so well spoken, though. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's something but, that I know. What type of thing do you have? A, like an idea? Like it, it? I'm sure you've noticed something in your speech that you're like, I got to kick this, right? Is that yes. right? Or do you? So have, it, it depends on how relaxed I am. So if I'm if I'm very relaxed, mm. um, I'm in a calm demeanor. I'm I'm typically at ease. But once I once something I get elevated, whether it could be good or bad, <laughs> it could just be excitement. I tend to stutter or mumble my words. Um, that's just, oh. that's a, yeah you i've noticed it and people that my wife notices it even my family member knows so yeah. if, you, if you quit it right now i mumbled just a second ago so that's something that i that i've noticed within myself oh, yeah. I i'm a big too. mumbler i mumble all the time yeah. i do uh i i have a big problem with the jaw clench when okay. i get angry or in front of like some people sometimes i'll do like the jaw clench i've seen you do like, that oh that's crazy yeah. i've actually seen you do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Where like I'll be like either I just get nervous talking to somebody or like I'm like mad, <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? I've Don Don see, Don see me get a little mad before, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, we you see the dog come out? So you know we I see hey I seen it too. Don Don let the dog out a couple of times and I've seen it, baby. You know, but no, it's hey, but it's all part of the game. But yeah, no, I've seen the. Uh, my, I remember my old man, his thing was like, he used to do this, like he would rub like his, you know, like the fang yeah, and like there, like he, <laughs> like that would be his thing when he would like get mad and talk to you like that. You're like, oh shit, time to go, <laughs> you know? But yeah, no, I, that's interesting to, to think of like, like because of your, your job is, is really like based on instilling confidence in the people that mm-hmm. you want to financially advise. I would have to think like that's probably going to be more commonplace in your field just because the ability to communicate properly and sell yourself, which Absolutely. is what you're doing. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's no, dude, you're, Absolutely. you're taking a step, a huge step in the right direction. And I think it's only going to be positive for your, for your job going forward. Thank you, Jamie. Do you have a financial question? Oh yeah. I got a couple of them. All right. So we're going to go now. This is uh, I guess we can't call it peg talk, Jamie. What do yeah. You Let's just call it, I don't know, interview questions. We don't, well, we can just skip this segment. Okay. Right. We'll just be Jamie. We'll just say, hey, it's Jamie. Jamie, yeah. you got any questions? Sure. No. Um, How did you get started in investing? So, that, yeah, so good question. So that, that actually starts when I was in, I think it was either the 11th grade, the 11th grade where they talk about the Great Depression. Ooh. And so one of the reasons, allegedly what they say is one of the reasons the Great Depression started was because the stock market crashed. Yeah. And that's the great mm-hmm. question. So I, my question to my teacher at the time, um, I asked, you know, what was it? What was it? What's the stock market? She said, it's a place where rich people make money. So <laughs> I, I kind of got hooked on it. Since then. That's when I was actually about 16. So what that, was your first yeah. investment? Uh, the first investment I bought was a company called IDTI, Integrated mm-hmm. Devices Technology. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the first stock I bought. It was, I, I bought it when I was, uh, about 19, I think. Mm-hmm. So I bought that stock. Um, do you have to be 18 to even play the stock market or can you play it at any age? No, you, you can play the stock market at any age. So what your parents could do, what parents will do is open up what you call UTMA accounts, UTMA accounts, mm-hmm. um, for any minor, almost like opening up a bank account. Oh, you open up an open account for any minor under the age of 18. Um, your parent you or guardian them. signs off on it. Yeah, and, yeah. Yep. Okay. And they get traced. So, you know, your, my, my... Your sons have them, right? Yeah, yeah. So, my, uh, all, both my, all my sons have, have up my accounts. In fact, my uh, youngest one, we were in uh, King of Prussia Mall and we were going by, what's the Louis Vuitton? 
And he said, can we stop in Louis Vuitton store? I said, for what? He's like, I want to buy a shirt. The hell, the hell you are. <laughs> <laughs> but what we did, here's what I did. I, I took him home and we researched Louis Vuitton, right? Who owns it, the company, et cetera. And then I had him buy the stock. So instead of you buying, mm, um, nice. you know. That's you great parenting, Don. Yeah. Great parenting. Yeah. Yep. Hell yeah. Was that Bryson? Oh, yep, shoot, was. I, yep. I don't want to yep. say his name. I'll, no, I'll you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Dude, little man, I'll tell you. Woo. I remember that kid. I that kid's been coming in the gym since he was five years old and throwing heat. Yeah. Oh, baby. Yeah. We've been wait. We've been waiting for him to get up and get this big for a long time. Kids can throw some hands, yeah. man. But he nah, doesn't even not, like it. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Seventy. I, but I. So remember last week when we had him sparring last week, like light sparring. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, we got home like the next day, and I'm like, "Man, you did good, man." Blah blah. And I could tell yeah. he start crying. I'm like, "What are you crying for?" He's like, "Oh, it's not fun." Blah blah. I said, "Listen, I understand that." I said, "But um, it's necessary." Yeah. You, you don't have a choice, unfortunately. You don't Agreed. have a choice. Skill development. Yeah. So it's, I said it builds character. Yes. And, and it's you have to learn how to defend yourself and your family when you get one. So yeah. that's that's part of the process. So dude, Don yeah, simply dude. said it's man yeah. shit is what it is. Like yeah. you're teaching him, like, yeah. dude. Could yep. not agree more. My dad said the same thing. He's like, yep. look, hopefully you'll never have to use this. Yep. Right? Like, best yep. case scenario, you never have to use this, but you need to have it. Yep. Better have it, not need it, need it, not have it, man. I could exactly. not agree more. Exactly. Plus two, I'll tell you this right now. Every it, This world would be a lot better if every son of a bitch got punched in the face. You know what At I'm least, saying? You like, know, you're right. Yeah, you're right. like. Every, right. every one of these punks got a little pop, you know. But he did, right. he did great, and I I watched them. He did great. You know? I, he's he's little he's hard on himself. That's that's he's just hard on himself. I realize it about him. Like he can yeah. do well and be like, oh, I'm like no, you you did. He's good. going out there thinking he's gonna drop him with every punch. And, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work. Like I had to tell him it's, that's not how it works. Yeah. That's not real life. That's not been real there. Life. Oh, yeah, I mean honestly, he's a thinker though. So I think like. Once he realizes it's like a chess match, I think that right. would interest him. But yeah. hey, whenever when he wants to, he will. But he, I mean, he definitely has it. So yeah. nice, very cool. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree with you more. That's for the development of young men. That is, yeah. it's a center and women too. You know what I mean? But Absolutely. like, he's gonna have to protect the household one day, and it's it's your job as a man to be able to do that. And that's, that's something that you know he needs and, to know. And I told him the next step outside of being able to use your hand is 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 called uh, the second amendment so that's something i told him listen we got to you got that's coming too so just yeah. know we're, we're going to be going to the range at some point too as well so we'll get used to it no no dude that's no I, I could not agree more i'll tell you i've said it on the show before i have a, a house gun at my house and i've researched and you know it, honestly someone uh we've you know rich lotta who was on the show before obviously don you know rich Yep. He's the owner of the Hensel Grace PA Academy where me and Don train at. And he, I, he's like big, he's really good with weapons and guns and things like that. So I had reached out to him because during the pandemic, I was living in the Northeast and like right, the, right after the police said that they weren't responding to small arms crimes anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Like this was like early, de- early doors pandemic. And like, dude, I remember the next day, like there was like a bunch of cars on my street that had gotten broken really? into and people complained about like remember that okay you know what i mean like it was just like kind of like a a a rash thing before the riots and stuff like that and i was just like man like i'm like and we were living with my in-laws at the time and i'm like you know i like i this is my father-in-law's house but i if it comes to protection here it's um it's falls to me yeah you know what i mean so i told him i was like dude what what am i gonna do you know like can you i asked him i was like what should i get right Mm -hmm. i was like should i get a handgun he's like no what you need is he told I got a Mossberg 20 gauge pump action shotgun, okay. right? Wow. And it's a pistol grip, which means you can hold it here, right? Because right. Right. I had I had had a hunting rifle, right? And okay. a hunting rifle is a yard yeah. long. So you yeah. can't like use a hunting rifle in a row home. There's just right. not enough right. room. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you'd be tur- like you're trying to turn it and it's like in the wall. Yep. So the best thing about the Mossberg 20 gauge is that you can put birdshot in it, so you will you will uh, disable an assailant, but you won't like you know you won't you won't like obliterate them, but you will put yeah. them down with birdshot. Yeah, and then you won't. It will be uh, less innocent, but like no chance, like really no chance for innocent bystanders or like a ricochet from the bullets to hit anyone. And also, God forbid, if my wife has to use it, she's able to use it right. also. You right. know what I mean? So like those are the things you need, but yeah, no, that's dude. I couldn't agree more. No gun. It. I think it's gun knowledge is very very important. They're tools, not toys, and that's yes. the thing that once you have respect for the weapon, 
right? Teaching respect for the weapon is essential. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. But we kind of went off on a tangent on that. Jamie, do you have another question? Sure. Um, what's one investment you almost made and didn't, but now you regret? Uh... Excellent question, Jamie. Excellent stinking question. Proud so, of you. Yeah, good question. You. So I think there is... So let me let me go back. There's one investment that I actually did make, but the regret is I actually I, I sold it. Oh, uh, and that was Amazon. Oh uh, no! Yeah, it was Am yep. Uh, yep. Why did well, you sell early, it? Early doors, Amazon. This was early Amazon. This was this wasn't even like this wasn't even back it was when he was selling it books. Was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Book, so I forget. I never forget it. I, I think I I forget the exact price, but it was. I think it may have been like four thousand dollars worth of Amazon. Um, and this was when the market was going crazy. So I made a little bit yeah. of money on it and yeah. I sold. But uh, had I known what I did, what had I known then what I know now, I would just I would have just kept it. What what could you have you done have you done the math on what you would have had if you would have kept it? I did it? not. Yeah, I don't even want to I don't even want yeah, to. Yeah, don't do it. Oh, that would <laughs> hard. But it's in, like it's seven figures, right? Yeah, like it has fact, to be. Me, uh, oh man. I'm, while we're talking, I'm go ahead, I'm I'm gonna look it up while we're talking, but go ahead. I'm, I'll, I'll take yeah, Lee. I mean Dude, I'll tell you, that's one thing. Like, I mean, I'm sure you've had other ones, but you know, I, I you know who Gary V is. Have you ever heard of Gary V? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like yeah. the entrepreneur guy. He uh he's he's talked about he has an email saved in his emails from uh the people of Bed Bath and or not Bed Bath, uh uh God, what is the the thing where you get Airbnb, where the it was the people of Airbnb reached out to him about an app where you can put out like different like houses for people to stay at while you're out of town and whatever. And he passed on it and he could have gotten in at the ground floor. And he says he keeps that email as a reminder of like, you know, don't pass up on, you know, right. Uh, I, I know. One thing, one thing that I've thought of on like that, uh, that had to be told to me on this show. And, you know, when you're doing different things and you're taking on an adventure, like a, a venture kind of on your own, you know, you do get like pride is a thing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like when you have experience at something and someone tries to tell you something and you're like, man, you don't know what the hell you talking about. You're just right. seeing it. You ain't doing it kind of thing like that. Yep. Like those thoughts do go through your head. And as much as it's like a thing, you know, yeah, you, you, you can't, you kind of let hubris get in the way sometimes. And someone told me this and it's so true is that you don't be mad where good ideas come from. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, like that <laughs> is so true. You know, like, mm. I mean, I might not like how the person told me it. I might not learn, like the person who even said it, but a good idea is a good idea. So don't waste it, you know? Yeah. All right, James, what else you got? How would you advise your clients to invest their money uh, with the current state of the economy? Woo! Yeah. Yeah, good question. So I think so. Number one, it really depends on what your individual goals and objectives are, right? So mm -hmm. if it's about retirement planning, right, you're looking mm -hmm. at retiring 30, 40 years from now, uh, then quite frankly, I would suggest just boilerplate a target date fund will help, right? A target date fund says you're going to retire in the year 2050. This fund's going to be very aggressive in the early years and will automatically adjust over time to become more conservative. So a target date fund would suit someone um, in that position. If you're a little more hands-on, you want more customization, uh, this is where having a, a, a good mix of different uh, stocks and bonds, mainly stock and bond mutual funds uh, with a certain percentage of stocks, bonds, maybe 70, 20, I'm sorry, 70, 30, 60, 40, et cetera. That's what I would recommend for maybe a younger person uh, looking at retirement long-term. If you're just building an investment portfolio, um, I typically tell clients stick with basic mutual funds like the S&P 500 index uh, or ETS, which are basically almost very similar, just some slight different differences. Uh, but typically any broad-based investment index fund uh, will, will suit you uh, long-term. Well, man, a lot of abbreviations in this financial stuff. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, okay. So <laughs> No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying for you, like, man, you got to remember all these abbreviations, that's tough. Okay. No, but no, uh, the first one you said about the retirement, what was that one called again? So that's called a target date fund. Target date fund. Okay. So yeah. So target date funds basically invest for time. And what they do is they will start out, let's say hundred percent stocks. Right. And what happens is over time, they will automatically shift out of stocks and into bonds by the time you retire. So for example, it could start at hundred percent stocks. Um, let's say you're going to retire again in the year 2050. It's, it's going to be called the 2050 fund, literally. And so what will happen is by the time the year 2050 comes around, it's going to shift out of stocks into bonds. So it goes from maybe 100% stocks to now maybe 60% stocks, 40% bonds by the time you retire. So it's a target date fund. Oh. And that's actually, those are standard within retirement plans. 
Uh-huh. So, so it's something you're like, look, and like you put it in there knowing like we're not touching this until then. Right. This is for them. Right. Oh, right. I see. So it's really like, I mean, it's a very long term investment. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And is yes. there like things put in place like where you're not allowed to unlock this until this date? No, you can touch it anytime you want. It's a fully liquid uh, investment. It's basically, it's a mutual fund. So it's fully okay. liquid. You have access to it. Obviously, if it's within inside a retirement account, there could be some tax penalties depending upon when you withdraw from a retirement account, such as an IRA. Mm-hmm. Man. And then, you, are you familiar with how IRAs work? How what? IRAs, individual retirement accounts. No, t- please. Okay. Explain. So, so you have you have your employer's retirement plan, like a four hundred one k, four hundred three b. Yeah. Uh, if you work for the federal government, it's a TSP. I have um, a 401k. Okay. So you work for a, you work for a company essentially. Yeah. And they match 5% of it. There we go. So yeah, you get your employer's match, uh, mm-hmm. whatever that percentage is in your case, 5%. Yeah. Uh, the most Which you is put good. In, yeah. The most you yeah. can put into your 401k this year, 2023, is 22,500, right? If you're yeah. over the age of 50, you can put in an additional 7,500 for a grand total of $30,000 for this year alone, right? So that's your employer plan. One thing you'll notice within your employer plan is that it will offer maybe 20 or 30 different mutual fund options, right? It'll, it, it'll have a target date fund in there, um, and then it'll have some other mutual funds in there that, that will be a little more uh, custom, so to speak. So it might have like an S&P 500 index fund, um, some other things like that. So that's that's your employer's plan. Always want to start there. Do your employer's match. And I always tell folks that if you start with your employer's plan or you're doing your employer's plan, you always want to enroll an automatic annual increase of at least 1% per year, right? So for example, if your employer matches you 5%, that's good. Always do that because anything less than that, you're giving away free money. But if you go from 5% and you increase that next year to 6%, doesn't sound like a lot, right? Mm-hmm. But what you effectively do is increase your savings by 20%. Does that make sense to you? So if you go from 5% yeah, yeah. to 6%, that 1% actually represents 20% increase in yeah. savings. Yeah, yeah. Because it's- so I tell folks you're, it's, every single yeah. year. Yeah, because yeah. five, you know, 100 goes, five goes into, you know, I mean, 20, yeah, yeah, I got you. Right? So five times yeah. 20 is 100. So you're adding exactly. one more unit. Got it. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yep. Wow, so I, I didn't even think that. of that. Yep. You you gain 20% of your initial investment in one year. Well, you're saving. You yeah, savings. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Savings. But more, still, right. man, that is, damn. Yeah, damn. that's how all it works. Right. I, I tell folks to do that. Always enroll in automatic increases of at least 1% per year. Or, you know, whatever you're comfortable doing, but at least 1%. Um, and then you have your individual retirement account. So that, those are separate and apart from your um, employer plan. Okay. So you have two types of individual retirement accounts. You have what's known as a Roth and a Roth. traditional IRA, okay. right? The traditional IRA allows you to put money in on a pre-tax basis. In other words, you receive a tax deduction going into a traditional IRA, right? That money grows tax deferred. And then once you withdraw later on in life, you pay the taxes then, right? Now you're required to withdraw from that account, the IRA for this year at age 73. But in your case, um, it'll be 75. So again, the traditional IRA allows you to put money on a, on a pre-tax base. You receive a tax deduction. It grows tax deferred, and then you, you pay the taxes then. With a Roth IRA, the money goes in after taxes. So you've already paid money on, on that. The money grows tax-free, and then once you withdraw later on in life, no additional taxes. So there's two types of IRAs, IRAs uh, that you could use to build a retirement plan or save for retirement. Um, and the most you can put in for this year is $6,500 per person if you're over the age of 50, you can do an additional one thousand dollars for a grand total of seventy five hundred. Um, and that, those are those are things you could set up. And I, in fact, if you have younger children and they work, they can establish a Roth IRA as well. Um, I've done that for my sons as well. When they have a summer job, you know, I put money in. Oh yeah, Roth IRA. And I kind of match it for them to kind of give them some incentive. Nice. Yeah, dude, that's great, man. Honestly, like, so you know, thinking of when we were coming up in school, as opposed to like you have kids in school now. The difference that they're teaching them as far as like even just financial, like how to handle yeah. finances in school between when we were coming up and now, mm-hmm. like we didn't even have it. They didn't teach us anything. No, really. Do they teach them now? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? It's oh, it's huge now. Yeah. Like managing oh, good, money management. Like, dude, I remember I had one teacher. She was a math teacher in sixth grade. One of the best things she ever did. She was teaching us per- percentages. Right. And it was, you know, sixth grade they're teaching you percentages. And she was like, everything is money. Right. Like, think of it as money. Right. Like 25 percent. Right. You know, like if you're looking at a, a, a dollar, a dollar is 100 pennies. What's 25 mm-hmm. percent of that? A quarter. You know right. what I mean? Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, so she really helped us break it down to that into the fact of like we learn how to like manage a checkbook. And write out checks and money. Like she made it like a game. Like if you say if you had got a hundred on a test, that was equal to a hundred dollars that you could add to your account 
and mm-hmm. later you could use it in an auction and whatever right yeah. so like no so but like that was ri- literally all we had but you no one has checkbooks anymore really no you know what i mean like no one's doing that but like being able to like have smart money management that is like the thing like they made it cool you know yeah. what i'm saying and a lot of it is because like athletes were like we're sick of losing all our goddamn money right you know what right. i mean true so like it's part partially it became like hey we know these kids are going to go on to be professional athletes why don't we teach them how to manage their money now so when they get there they're good to go so what kind of differences have you seen between when we were coming up as to like when your sons are your son that just graduated from high school? No, to your point, I think you you are. So growing up, I think we had home economics or one of the other courses, but I don't think I don't recall growing up learning about anything financial nope. outside of my own my own activity. Right. Um, so the now stuff you research yourself. Yeah, it was stuff I did on my own. Now you're seeing not only with YouTube and social media, you're, now you are starting to see there is a push to teach financial education in schools. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it should be necessary for all grade levels to learn about financial literacy in some, some capacity, because no matter what you do in life, whether you become a doctor or a lawyer, engineer, you always have to deal with your money. That's something we all have in common. We all have to have Very a bank true. account. We all have to save. We all have to have that. We all have to save financially. So I think it's, I think that should be mandatory. That's actually something I push heavily. Um, yeah. Mandatory. Smart. mandatory. No, yeah, dude. Definitely. Very smart. Honestly, like, I wish I had more of that. Like, you know, I dealt with a lot of cash coming up before I got the office job I have now. So my brother has always been like incredible at money management. Okay. And he ain't cheap. You know what I'm saying? It's not like he's doing it because he ain't spending. He, He ain't cheap, but he's also like really good at money management. I'm okay with it, but he really, really kind of excels with it and does well. And like, he cool. has he has a financial advisor and like nice. he works like uh, at a bar and like he makes good money but he knew like he had to set up a retirement and things like that so yeah, he kind of got lucky get, getting into like someone who could help him with that and he does really well with that but i really wish like that would have been something that you know would at least been ex- we've been exposed to as young kids in, in a yes. way where it's like it is now but it yeah. is what it is not so even. yeah, go ahead. I was no one of the things that I that I did. I think um that I that I've actually done for my kids that what obviously wasn't done for me just you know for whatever reason is I actually added my son to my credit card. Actually, we did it for both. We did it for my 22 year old and our 18 year old. Uh-huh. So my 22 year old was added to my wife's credit card. By the time he was 18, his score was like 750, right? Um, and then we added David to my credit card. His score is like 744. All right, so he's 18. Phenomenal. Right, because you added, and then what I did was I basically added him phenomenal. as an authorized user. You can do that. So you can add your kid as an authorized user to your account, right? And by the time they're, you know, 18, they've got, not only do they have maybe 10, 15 years of, of history, they got a yeah. solid credit score to build them. Yeah. So that means like when they go to get a car, or when they need yes. this or that or whatever, like they're damn dude that is fantastic that's a great idea yeah that's an absolutely great idea honestly i probably will do that with my daughter yeah it's like you have to teach financial responsibility it is especially now the way the world is eventually we're all going to have a barcode on our wrist and you're going to get credit right right. right. do you got to be able to handle that shit yeah or what you could do for her you could open up a separate credit card low balance and and buy a subscription service like netflix and just pay it off each month that way you just small balance you're just paying it off each month and it's it's building up credit i can do that in her name right now so you, you, you would you would get a credit card in your name and has and her as an authorized user yeah do a subscription service somewhere whatever yeah. i'm sure you've got one netflix where i can put all of them on i got all right. of them and they'll just pay it off each month Dude, and that, that, will, is... that will her credit score will by the time she well, she's what two or three now three yeah yeah, by the time she's 15, she's going to have 15 Seven, years of yeah. credit history. Damn. I'm going to tell my wife we're going to do that shit tomorrow. Yep. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Don. All right. So I do want to ask a couple other questions. Sure. Jamie, uh, did you have any more particular ones you wanted to ask? Or are you good? I'm good. No, you're great. I'm great. Okay. So, Don, if someone were to ask you, are you fiduciary? What would that mean? And are you fiduciary? Yeah. So there's, yes, there, there's two, that's, that's coming from a professional, I assume. Okay. Was that, is that question coming from a professional? It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So there are two standards to investment. There is what's called the suitability standard. Then there is the fiduciary standard. Suitability just means whatever product service I recommend just has to be suitable for you. 
right? Based mm-hmm. on your income, expenses, et cetera, so forth. Mm-hmm. So when you're a fiduciary, uh, this means you have to act within the best interest of that client, no matter what the case may be. So I am a certified financial plan, which means I am a fiduciary. Uh-huh. So, okay. So you're, so you really like, it's kind of a license to save the client from themselves in a way, right? We're, yeah. But really, really just about putting the client first is what it boils down to. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And so if I were to invest with you, what would my, what would my all in cost? Like, what is, what would that entail? If I were to say, you know, ask you, what are my all in costs? If we were to, you know, be, I guess, work together, I know it would depend on, would it depend on like my, you know, my yearly earnings and things like that? No. So it's, it's really dependent. It it depends on your investable assets, right? So investable assets drives the actual fee itself. So for example, as I was saying earlier, it could be a 1%, really it's about 1.1% fee Uh plus it depends on the internal investment. So, or, or what we recommend. So for example, um, it's 1.1%, but if it's, if you have a portfolio that's stocks, individual stocks, you uh-huh. just pay the one point one percent. If right. it's a portfolio that's inclusive of mutual funds, you pay uh-huh. the one point one percent plus the internal expense ratios of, of that fund, and that they could range maybe twenty five basis points to upwards of maybe seventy five basis points internally. Okay, depending upon the actual investment. Oh, nice. All right, and then would uh, is the asset allocation? Which one would you use? So we yeah we would focus on asset allocation. We would just recommend. Or put full of stocks. We would always start out with your, you know, what are your objectives, and then mm-hmm. from there build an asset allocation based portfolio that's specific to you. And like when you say the asset, you're saying car, house, like things like that. No, so let me let me clear. When you say okay. that again, when you say like an asset is an asset like your car, your house, and those things, or there's two ways you look at it, right? So really, it's your overall net worth or the or your personal balance sheet right? Uh-huh. Net worth is basically your assets minus your liabilities, right? So if you've got assets, which is your home, car, investments, business property, et cetera, worth a million, and you've got liabilities of, let's say, $250,000, which could be your mortgage, et cetera, then your net worth is seven fifty, dollars right? What we yeah. do as wealth managers is we actually, so some folks will manage just the, the investments, right? So the assets themselves, right? The actual investment portfolio, which is really going to be either an IRA, a non-retirement account, or we're looking at rolling over a 401k. That's that's the investable asset portion. Does that make sense to you? So you theoretically yeah. could have assets of, let's say, a million, but only have investable assets of 500,000. We're focused on the investable assets. Now, having uh-huh. said that, as wealth managers, we do focus on the other side of the balance sheet, which is the liability side. So we do have a private banking or we work with clients to help uh, really maintain their debt obligation or help them maximize the cost of their debt, essentially. Mm, damn. Nice. What? Well, okay. Very cool. And then, all right. Uh, so would you say, like, do you have a, I guess, is, would that be part of like your investment philosophy then? Where it's like you take their, you know, available assets, like the assets they can actually use to spend with. And then would the philosophy be dependent on like what they're looking for to to spend? Like say like if they want to do for retirement, if they want to do for to build like their portfolio to expand to eventually take over themselves, like do you know that stuff going in and do you have a different philosophy for each person? So in terms of so our investment philosophy in terms of how we build investments. Um, that's going to be, that's going to remain the same across the board, uh-huh. right? So we believe in, you know, momentum, small cap growth, et cetera. That's kind uh-huh. of our philosophy long-term, but we also believe in just broad-based asset allocation. Now, what will change is based on your individual objectives and your goals for the money, right? So for example, let's assume you, it's you, you're, are you, what are you, 38? Yeah. 30, okay. So you're 38, right? So let's assume you and I meet, you're going to have a uniquely different situation than someone, let's say, who's 60 years of age. And getting ready to retire, right? Okay. So the recommendation will change based on your circumstances and your your you know where you are financially. Okay, I see. All right, nice. That makes sense. So okay, so then, uh, very nice. So then, what would you? Okay, so then, if you say, all right, say if you have someone that's like has like credit card debt and they want to invest to make extra money to get rid of their credit card debt, what kind of inf- like you know is would you say that's a good idea? not to do that or like how what would your advice for them be yeah so i'm not i'm not a fan of folks because tip so i'm not a fan of individuals investing Mm -hmm. for the sole purposes of paying down credit card debt yeah right now there's two ways i look at that if you say i've I've got a credit card i've got some credit card debt i need to get down then we have to look at why you have the debt you have Mm -hmm. in the first place right Mm -hmm. and that could be a function of 
your ex- your your expenses mm-hmm. or your spending habits. Mm-hmm. So before we look at using investments to pay down the credit card debt, we need to look at the debt itself and where it's coming from, right? Is it coming from your spending habits, which you haven't necessarily maintained yet, yeah. uh, or is it just something that happens over time, right? Yeah. Because if it's a situation where we look at your spending habits and you don't have tight controls in place, then we need to address that first before we mm-hmm. look at repositioning and, and taking investments and, and paying that credit card debt. Yeah. Having said that, though, if you have investments, for for example, if we have, let's say, $10,000 of investments versus $10,000 in credit card debt, the question then becomes, what are you earning on your investments? And then what are you paying on the credit card debt that would justify whether or not you need to pay it all? So for example, if your investments are only earning 10% and you have credit card debt of, of 20%, then you take the investment portfolio, pay down the credit card debt because you're saving money on interest. Oh, right? wow. Because you're getting the fit, right. like, yeah. Because right. if you don't, yeah, because you're getting a VIG on that anyway. So it's like you're, you know, it's kind of you're spending money to make the money in a way. Right, right. Okay. But, and see. this is why I say it's, so if you have a spending problem, then mm-hmm. what's going to happen is that, and I've actually had this before, and I've worked with individuals who are well off financially, they'll run up a credit card and I, we work together. Okay, well, here's what you're paying on one credit card. Let's do a balance transfer, 0% interest for 16 months, whatever the, whatever the introductory period is, and just pay it that way. Um, mm-hmm. But what happens is they'll they'll do that. And then we meet again in a year or so, and they ran a credit card back up. So that suggests there's a spending. Yeah, uh, yeah. dude, I'll tell you, you know, what's crazy is that like one of the things like I think would be that is the most valuable thing that you you as a financial av- advisor, you would provide to anybody is knowledge of the system. Right. Mm-hmm. Like what you just said there of transferring debt from one account to another with zero percent interest right. for this amount of months. Right. Like that right there hadn't a clue. Didn't even know that's possible. But you know all that. Like, you know, all the little tricks, you know, like, hey, let's build your kids credit by putting them as an authorized user on a small credit card. Use it just for this, blah, blah, blah. So like all these small little tips and tricks are just like unbelievably incredible. And that's really what they're paying for is like that kind of knowledge, man. And that's like, dude. That kind of knowledge is it's so important. And especially like if you're a head of a household, you know what I mean? Like imagine if you have like more than like, you know, like if you have three kids, if you put them all as authorized users on that, then they all get good credit. You know what I'm saying? Like and having good credit is going to be so important in the future because cash is disappearing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like everything is going to be electronic soon. Everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. So like having, yeah, cash is going to be obsolete, you know? So like, like we're going to be talking in 20 years. Like remember those music videos where they would have big <laughs> stacks of cash, man, they don't even have that anymore. It's they get one little computer chip and that's a big blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be like, I got my chips or whatever the yeah, song is yeah. going to be. You know what I mean? Like I got my chips, I've got chip drip, whatever the well, hell it's going to well, be. Think, well, think about, it, think about it from the standpoint of, and I was telling you about, tell you about David, right? Where, he was in my car and, and he was like, dad, what the heck is that? I'm like, that's a portable CD player. <laughs> like they don't even have those anymore. Like they don't, they, they, they're not, you can't even buy us. Like, think about it. That was yeah. like, you had a CD, a portable CD player. Uh, back then you, you were like, wow, where'd you get that? That was a dope. Like, bro, wow. Oh yeah. You, you carried a case. You don't need, you've got, you've got this phone here. Like no, yeah, everything is here. So dude, that's he was, he, he, dude, it's crazy to think like the Walkman was a cassette player. That was big, right? <laughs> Everyone was like that. But then when you got the CD player, yeah. you're like, what? This Walkman is a joke. Then right, right. you got the iPod and yep. you're like, yo, your CD player is stupid. It skips whatever. The iPod will never skip and blah. It's got all hundreds of songs. Then you had like the iPod Nano. Yep. Right. And then you went from the iPod Nano and then you went back to the iPod and then it went to the iPhone, which was when it was like like we all saw it coming. Whereas like you can take your iPhone and your or your iPod and your phone and you mix them together. Right. And you got right. like, you know what I mean? Like we all saw yeah, that coming. Right. Dude, it's crazy to think. I mean, dude, it's just nuts. Like that's like, you know, like that. It's like all of that is so obsolete. But at the time. Like when it was cutting it, dude, I remember when you could get an iPod that had like a color screen and everyone's like, dude, what? Right, There's right, colors right, on right, the screen. Right. Holy shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now it's like you're plugged in wherever you go. Like 
everywhere. You're on the subway watching YouTube and shit. You know, I know, you know right? Like, you, you know, you know what I, I, I used, to, I, I used, to, I, this was like a thing back then. I actually had a, I would love on a Friday night going to like Blockbuster, picking out a movie like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, like you know, dude. that was like a thing back. Then. Let me get that one. Now it's just, yep. it's not the same. It, it, that's, it, it shows you how quickly things have changed over. Oh, dude, I, I, dude, I could not agree with you more. I remember. When we first started the show, I had a co-host. His name was Shake. His name was Tom, but I called him Shake. And, dude, we had talked about, I miss so much of, like, a trip to the movie, the video yeah. store. Right? Like, I remember we would go to Hollywood Video, yep. right? We'd roll in, and everyone get to pick a movie, or it was your night to pick the movie, or whatever. Like, it was awesome, man. Yep. Awesome. Like my dad would go to like the classics and he'd pick something and then like a new movie would be out that you didn't say, Oh, Braveheart or whatever. Like, yep. oh man. And then like sometimes it was so good you'd buy it. Like yes, the yes, best, dude. The best. Man. I, I still oh. have a collection of, of DVDs from Blockbuster. Dude, I remember back in the day, I used to I was uh bartending at this place and I didn't drive at the time. So I would have it would be an hour and seventeen train ride, hour and seventeen minute train ride one way, right? Wow. So my big thing, man, portable DVD player, baby. Oh, oh, portable wow. DVD. Dude, it was the gimmick. I had like, you know what was big back then? Remember when you were first able to start buying full seasons of a show on DVD? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Dude, I had like all oh, like every season of Scrubs and all that oh. shit. Like I had all that stuff, man. Like, I was watching, like, full seasons of shit on a train ride. Oh, dude, the best, dude, man. So, you know, simpler times. But now it's, like, it's crazy. Dude, I remember, like, even, like, when she, I remember I was dating a girl at the time, and she had had Netflix, and she was, I was, like, you know, like, we were talking, and she, like, I was, like, staying, I was, you know, I had stayed the night at her apartment, and then I was like, can I just stay here? Because I got to go to work and we're, I'm closer here and whatever. And I have my stuff. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she had to go to work. She's like, also, I mean, you could watch Netflix too. I was like, what? what? What do you mean? What did you get from Netflix? She's like, no, you can watch Netflix. I was like, what? She's like, yeah, on my computer that you can go on there and they have like seasons of shows that you can like watch it on the app. I was like, what? Dude, when you were first able to stream, I remember they had lost on Netflix. Bro. Did I do like, oh, I was like, so I was like injecting lost into my, like, I was like, dude, how, you know, like going from having to order a DVD to be mailed to you to now being able to stream it. Insanity. But man, that's just the world we're living in. It's a fast yeah. moving crazy world. So, all right, we are coming towards the top of time. We did go a little over time, Don, but dude, I'll tell you, Don, man, I was super excited to have this. I love learning about like, just the, the financial world itself is crazy. You know what I mean? It's a mm -hmm. crazy, crazy world. And there's like a ton of knowledge out there for people to have. And if they don't understand it and don't know where to get it from, right? Like it's, there's so many different things you can do to help expand your, your financial knowledge. And even Definitely. just like, dude, people love like tricks of the gimmick. You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, like if you, you everyone loves a way, if you can work a system, everyone loves to work the system. So a lot of the stuff, you know, like, you know how to make the system work for you. You know what I mean? So we are coming towards the top of time, though. So, Don, thank you so much for being on. Uh, do you have anything you want to say to your friends and family? Or No, or no, it's, it's, or... a, it's a pleasure uh, being here. You know, financial planning and financial wealth management is, is my passion. It's, it's what I do. Um, if, you, if you have any interest, you can follow me on, at Money Talk with Don Lyons on Facebook. Yeah. Um, that's where I, I make some posts every a few times a week, and uh, you can follow me there. Yeah, and we'll have links in the description of this episode for yep. all Don's stuff. So I would highly suggest checking it out. It's awesome, man. Don knows what he's talking about. Great information. Obviously, you can see from today's show, like he is a wealth of knowledge that you would be a fool to waste it. Even absolute fool. So really, really cool. Thanks, Don. Uh, Thank Jamie, anything you want to say to the Jamie Iglesias fanatics? aka your fan base aka the pegs the peggers mm -hmm. what are we calling them the peggies the, the peggies all right anything mm -hmm. you gotta say to the peggies before we take off well, this has been the financial education that i should have gotten in high school <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. yeah man no you, yeah i could hey i i would i mean i would have loved this financial education 10 years after high school you know what i mean, I mean yeah, anytime I would love it that. yeah really <laughs> But no, honestly, I'm literally going to go talk to my wife after this about setting up that credit card just for Definitely. our subscription services 
and putting our daughter like put it under my name but make my daughter yeah. an authorized user and just because like honestly we have we have like i being ever, like peacock paramount disney plus yep. netflix mm-hmm. you know we have freaking everything so yep. Might as well put it under that and dude, like if it can help build her credit by the time she's ready to get a credit card. I mean, if she's able to have it like a, cause dude, I didn't have a credit card literally until, I mean, I guess I was 30 when I had my first credit card. Right. Okay. And like my score was atrocious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I, I, I didn't really have yeah. one, you know what yep. I mean? So that happens. Yeah, but now, dude, I mean, ever since I had it, my, my score is incredible. I'm in the 700s, man. I'm that's killing good. It. Hell that's yeah, good. baby. Yeah, Hell good. yeah, that's why I got a house, you know? But nice. All right, so we are coming towards the top of time. Uh, this has been another episode of The Working Perspective Podcast. I'm Matt Lavelle, coming today by the one and only Jamie Iglesias. And our guest today is the man himself, Money Talks with Don Lyons, the man, the myth, Super excited for this. In case you all are wondering, you can find all our stuff and all our content and all podcast platforms and YouTube at Work Perspectives Podcast. You can know, us on Instagram at Work Perspectives Podcast. You can join us on Twitter and TikTok at Working Pete Pod. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please email us at workperspectives at gmail.com. Please like, subscribe so we can bring you this sweet, sweet content. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Thanks. See you.